Good morning. I'm Stan Stahl of Secure the Village, and today we're going to be talking about information classification and control. Welcome to welcome to our webinar. Um, so, uh, webinar first things first. Uh, we got to pay the sponsors, and uh, this Secure the Village webinar is brought to us by my company, Citadel Information Group, and the law firm of Jeffrey Mangles, Butler, and Mitchell, uh, one of whose partners is our guest today. Uh, so, with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our guest, Michael Gold. Mike's uh, co-chair of the Cybersecurity and Privacy Group at Jeffrey Mangles, Butler and Mitchell. And he's also the principal author of a book to be published by Bloomberg BNA uh, in their portfolio series. It's titled Enterprise Security, Cybersecurity Governance. Michael, welcome to our uh, webinar. Thank you, Stan. Yeah, so um, to get started, um, you know, Michael and I often sit at uh, lunch at uh, one of our favorite Century City restaurants, and we'll talk about cybersecurity. It's it's one of the things that uh, is, is typically on our mind. And we'll often talk about how, whether from the legal perspective or the management perspective, uh, organizations typically will fail to have a, a really good handle on um, the different kinds of information that they have and how it needs to be protected. Um, and the consequences are significant. I mean, whether when there are incidents, the better you've got this stuff under control, the less costly, um, the less disruptive an incident is going to be. And correspondingly, the least less you have it under control, the the more challenging it's 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 going to be. And uh, Michael, let's just stop here and talk about that particular piece for a second. Right. Well, um, you know from our many discussions about this, and from our many co-engagements on behalf of clients that that the first step my view at least is the first step in developing a, a an effective security structure information security structure in any organization is to know where your information is if you don't know where your information is you're not going to protect it um, when you speak to hackers one of the things that they're banking on uh, in order to make their lives easier, their exploits more effective, is that the organizations they're hacking into do not know where all of their data is. And if you don't know all, it, the analogy that I use, it's it's almost as if the, the, the president or the National Security Council says, we can protect 48 of the states, we just don't know where the other two are. Um, it's not a long stretch to say that if you know where some of your data is, but you don't know where all of your data is, it's not going to be possible for you to have technological measures in place to protect that data whose location is unknown or whose nature is unknown uh, or people who don't know where it is. Yeah, exactly. And if you, if you look at the chart that's up on the screen right now, uh, it kind of puts the whole um, identification of information as the primary function of the, the chart up here, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. That's the National Institute of Standards cybersecurity framework. And identify is that pop first function, having to know, uh, we describe as three imperatives. Know what it is, what information do you have that needs to be protected? Know where it is, like you just said. And the other piece as well is, okay, Who's got responsibility? Who's got authority for deciding, okay, Michael, you've got access, Stan, you don't have access. Why? Because you have a need to know, I don't have a need to know. And correspondingly, how sensitive is it? Uh, some information we want to be not protected, our website for example, not protected. Other people get to see it, get to, to see it. Our business cards, things like that. Uh, an ad we put in a newspaper, other stuff, electronic protected health information, just to use one example, whoa, that's very sensitive and really has to be protected. Somebody's got to be able to make those decisions. Yeah. yeah. So uh, with with that, so, you know, the, the first thing then is, okay, so what is the information required? What do we have to protect? And in broad terms, this flows into two different categories. One is information of others that we have to protect, and then internal information assets. And, you know, we've been together enough on both engagements and, you know, you're sitting in a conference room that I've shared on many occasions for a lot of talks that you, you host. Uh, where oftentimes it's the discussion of these kinds of, you know, what are the things we have to protect? So let's spend a couple of minutes just talking in general about this. Yeah, I think it's I think it's worthwhile before we get into talking about the the categories of information that that, that must be protected is uh, to me a, a an even larger issue because you know, Stan, that the process of getting people 
to go out and identify information and you know put it in a model that permits an organization to have some semblance of control over it is probably the most arduous task, right? Yeah. And 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 one of the issues we face is is not so much not knowing what personally identifiable information is, not knowing what HIPAA protected information is, not knowing what credit card information is. I think those kinds of data categories, at least at a fairly high analytical level, are very easy to identify. The real issue is in a lot of organizations and in virtually every client I've worked with, uh, particularly, by the way, in connection with GDPR compliance, the European Union's general data protection regulation that went into effect on May 25th, is actually finding out where this stuff is. The organizations have so many custodians, so many owners of data, so many managers of data, whether they have those titles or not, that the, 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 the task of simply arranging a strategy under which people are going to go out and actually identify the data and where the data is located uh, can consume an enormous amount of time and resources, particularly um, when you look at the kinds of data that most organizations have. As you know, most organizations have unstructured data, right? You've got structured data, you know, prescribed data models um, that respond to machine requests fairly easily like spreadsheets. But then you've got unstructured data, which, which many commentators believe constitutes like 70 to 80 percent of the data that most organizations have. Unstructured data like emails, text messages, JPEGs, things like that, things that um, don't have a, a predefined data model, even though like an email, for instance, you would think it does. But it really doesn't, because if it really did have a predefined data model, you would be able to structure it in your system by way of subject matter, mm -hmm. right? significance of the message, and generally you can't do that with emails. So, so for me, you know, the real issue is is not so much this list, although this is an important list for for purposes of framing the discussion. But where is this stuff, and who do we talk to to find out? Mm -hmm you know, where this stuff is. Exactly. And, and what you're saying, and, and we'll get more on this as we get further uh, further into the webinar, but it's, <laughs> it's, it, it gets to the heart of the question of how are we to protect it? It's, as you just said, somewhat easy to at least identify the categories that need to be protected. Uh, what we have here on the right-hand side of the screen, the internal assets, are, of course, the things that become a little harder to identify because you don't have something like GDPR or the payment card industry data security standard or HIPAA to help you say, these are the things we're talking about. Uh, but you know, I, I remember, for example, being in, in, in the conference room you're sitting in uh, a year or so ago when you guys put on a, a, a morning talk on uh, security and the mergers and acquisition process. And now we're looking at all these things potentially on the right-hand side that constitute information assets of a company that unstructured in, in, in so much of it. And yet, uh, if you're looking at a merger, you've absolutely got to make certain that, you know, you've got your arms around protecting it. The other thing that we'll find often when we go in is the item here like passwords to critical systems. People just aren't really sensitive to that that's also forms a class of protected and, and, uh, information that way. Well, we'll, we'll, we're gonna, we'll necessarily wind up talking a bit about the human factor, you know, mm -hmm. in, this, in this element of information management security, uh, where it's just as significant as it is in you know, the actual security mechanisms and strategies that companies deploy. But, but see, one of the things that people really need to understand is that, is that this, whole, this whole subject of identifying the data you have classifying the data for purposes not just of managing it but also protecting it this is not going to get easier i mean there are, there are some commentators knowledgeable and reliable commentators uh, who have expressed the position the opinion that by between 2010 and 2020 there will have been a 50-fold increase in the volume of data that is created in the world um, what i read recently is that by 2020 uh, the world will possess 40 zettabytes of data. Now, Stan, you're a mathematician. Yes. I don't know what a zettabyte is. It sounds like it's a really large number. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I confess. Uh, right. Yeah, and, I don't either, but so, I know it's big because I know the, petabytes are big and this has got to be bigger than that. 
And so, and so what happens in the typical organization, you know, probably more pronounced than larger organizations, but even in smaller organizations, is, is that even if a decision has been made um, to go out and identify and classify information for management and protection purposes, the challenge is that, that the creation of information doesn't stop during this process. You know, the, the information continues to be created. Uh, and as organizations grow larger, um, the, their scope of operations increases or expands, the data that gets created can just outstrip an organization's ability. What, what the organization has decided um, it needs to have in terms of resources to go out and complete a project like this. And so very often what we found, what we find is, and we found this in, a, in, in several of our GDPR uh, engagements, is that there are companies that actually started this process but like gave up in frustration or yeah. sort of stopped to take a breather and never resumed it. And Stan, yeah. I know, Stan, I know you've encountered that paradigm as well. Yeah, we we definitely around so much of security, and and you're right. This particular one is is it's a challenge. It's it's a difficult thing to manage, to truly get your arms around and to keep it going, and that that's where. And it's been explicit in these webinars. This is our seventh. But if you go all the way back to the first, uh, it's all about leadership. And the second is about management at that executive senior level. Um, it's the executives that have to understand the importance of this. And in doing so, make sure that the resources are available to do the work that's needed in documenting your one's information. Um, and, and also understand that uh, not just the resources are available, but the pressure, if you will, the leadership pressure. Is it done? How are we doing? That needs to be an ongoing discussion. I want to move on to the, the next slide, which begins a process of, okay, just at least at a policy standards level, how do you get your arms around this in terms of what's to be done from a policy perspective? And what do all these words mean, in a sense? So we're going to take a little sojourn, if you will, down this this path. Um, with This is an example classification and control policy. It, it actually comes from work that our company does. And basically what it says, we, we start with the presumption, and again, it's explicit in these webinars, that there's an information security manager who has been appointed by the executive. And that person's responsibility uh, supported by a, a leadership team, and again, we've got webinars already discussing what this looks like. Uh, it's the security manager's responsibility to kind of make all this happen. Uh, in the case of classification and control, our policy assigns departments the responsibility for managing the information of the security that they generate and use, and the department managers are expected, and here we get into some of the substance, identify, classify, and control their information, in accordance with the harm that would result from a loss of confidentiality, integrity, or availability. That, that to us, and I know we've had discussions around the legal side of it, this in accordance with the harm. The, it's to, to us, it's always a harm-based issue. If there's no harm in information being public, don't right. waste money protecting it. But if harm could happen, now we've got to figure out how much harm, and if so, or to that extent, we, we've got to protect it. Well, that's kind of a, you know, at least at least for a lot of folks in the United States, that's kind of a challenging concept to use as a driver mm -hmm. behind these projects. Uh, as you know, it's it's much more, much well, not only is it much more prevalent, it's actually baked into the general data protection regulation. Um, one of the key factors that you look at in terms of your handling of information, personal information and sensitive personal information is, is what kind of harm is associated with your processing activity. Mm -hmm. One of the... Um, one of the, I guess in retrospect, I'm now looking at it almost as a privilege is that uh, in working with uh, clients uh, to achieve GDPR compliance, one of the things we needed to do was to create um, um, the GDPR article uh, register of data processing activities. And what that process required is that, you know, the companies go out and they determine what kind of data they have who has it, who owns it, who has access to it, how long they're keeping it and why, how sensitive or critical it is, you know, laid out in a logical way so that someone can actually see the map of all this information 
and its location um, inside the organization. <clears throat> that's, extreme, that's extremely helpful. There, there, we would encounter initially a lot of resistance there, but in most cases, <clears throat> what we found and what we've heard is that it turned out to be, in the eyes of most clients, a very helpful project. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, it's not so much that you can attach a return on investment to this stuff, because that's very difficult to do. But what you can probably say is that achieving it will permit a company to stay in business and make money and make a profit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that, that is uh, well said, I guess, bottom line. It's, will permit you to stay in business. Uh, what you said as well about the kind of controls that have to be on it, uh, is it goes to the second bullet here as well, that it's the department manager whose responsibility is to identify, okay, who has access to it, always using this need to know concept, least privilege, need to know. If you don't need it, you don't have access to it. We will give you the least access to the system, least privileges on the system that you need to get your job done. So if you don't need access into the HR files or the accounting department or whatever, we don't give you those that access. And furthermore, we expect the IT department to segment the network to enforce that as well, even if you, not you, Michael, but there are people on inside of companies that try to exceed their privileges and we need IT to, to block those as well. So part of this responsibility is identifying those groups or individuals who well, are to have access. Yeah, I think I think you can you can you can make the point and even be a little bit more blunt about making the point. The, the, what, what, what I what I found almost since the, the you know beginning of my cybersecurity practice is that in these kinds of environments there 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 are a couple of different features that, that exist in all of them. One is um, the intellectual fatigue that can be created by having to manage something that's intangible or invisible. Mm -hmm. okay, that, that, that I see in virtually every organization. So, so in order to manage this process the right way, you've got to have a fair degree of fortitude uh, and leadership qualities. Um, the other is, and, and Stan, you've seen this also from the beginning of your career, uh, in these kinds of environments, people tend to take shortcuts. They tend to take shortcuts because people tend to take shortcuts in every environment. The issue, however, is that in these kinds of environments, information control, management control, and security, those shortcuts can create existential vulnerabilities mm -hmm. for organizations. So this, this whole process, and, and in fact, to me, this is really one of the key issues here. Who is in control of this process? You know, you can't have a lot of cooks making this dinner. There, 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 there really has to be a person in control who has domain knowledge and people mm -hmm. skills to get people to do what they're going to do because mm -hmm. you're not going to you can't achieve this overnight and this is as you know a very dynamic process you know it's really never ending because you're constantly accumulating information so so very true let's let's go on to the next slide that begins to segment the information we have we do it into three buckets, the three general buckets. Pub some information is public, some information is internal use, meaning if you work in the organization, you have access to it. If you don't work in the organization, you don't. And then there's the holy of holies, restricted information. Electronic protected health information, need to know least privilege. Credit card information, need to know least privilege, et cetera, et cetera. All of which, and again, it's, it's what we talked about, uh, commensurate with harm. And I've listed some of the things, and you've lived through a lot of these as we have, some of the bad things that can happen when, whether it's confidentiality is breached, whether uh, integrity, uh, somebody's salary changes without anybody knowing it, uh, or the availability, a ransomware attack or an earthquake here in California. And then uh, we've just listed seven of the bad things that can happen. Uh, there are there are lots more as as well. True. Yeah. True. 
Yeah. So uh, if we look at the, and the next chart, just kind of look through what each of these mean in 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 kind of generic terms. Public information, no restrictions on access. It's not if, if it's disclosed, it's not expected to cause any problems. Newsletters, brochures, and so on. Uh, internal use information, employee manuals, forms, templates, training materials. Um, mm -hmm. In some organizations, personnel phone extension lists fall in, into this category. Uh, things of, of, of that nature. Um, and then, as I said, we get into the, the holy of holies, if you will, with, re with restricted information. This is where so much of our work lives, is in, in, in this category. And you can, can begin to see on the right-hand side, uh, whether it's external information, as we talked about earlier, that we're protecting because of laws, regulations, uh, things of that nature, or it's internal information that we need to protect ourselves. Uh, this is the, the stuff that's restricted. Uh, and here, uh, unauthorized disclosure to people without a need for access, uh, we've written, may cause, may be against laws and regulations, uh, may cause significant problems for the organization. It may even cause grave damage. Uh, there was a study, goes back a few years, that among small businesses, uh, 250 employees or smaller that uh, did suffer a cyber breach. They were victims of a cyber crime. 60% of them went out of business within six months. I think uh, that that number strikes me as just too high, at least with, with ransomware being a less uh, costly event for a lot of companies. But I still think it's, it's just illustrative that when we talk about grave damage to the organization, we are talking existential threat here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, and here with your 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 slide 10 on information classification restricted, um, mm -hmm. you know, to put to, to put an international point on it, although I think that, that as the law in the United States becomes not just sectoral, you know, but 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 a little bit more, I, I guess you could call it organic, like the GDPR in the GDPR. This is nothing to laugh about. You know, in other words, not only, you know, not only do you expose yourself to the, um, you know, usual list of uh, unholy outcomes like brand, repu you know, brand and reputational damage legal fees, but you know that the, that the penalty levels, you know, in the GDPR are absolutely enormous. And, you know, if you're a, if you're a United States company doing business in the European economic area uh, and you're not doing what you need to do with restricted information, uh, whether it's personal information covered by the GDPR or um, sensitive personal information like political, uh, genetic uh, health information, uh, you run the risk, is it, 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 the larger you are as an organization, of getting dinged pretty badly. And, and, and it is true, while it is true that a number of the regulators in the European Union are underfunded, at this point to to vigorously enforce the GDPR. There are some regulators who are nevertheless very active. For instance, the UK privacy regulator is extremely active. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, some 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 organizations in Germany, you know, are going to get extremely active. So this is not something that you can blow off and say, we'll get to it when we need to get to it, because when you need to get to it is now. Yeah. Uh, people, people most organizations do not understand the massive asymmetry. You know, when you're talking about risks, mm -hmm. putting aside the inability of most organizations to, to effectively measure, identify and measure what their actual risks are. And Stan, you and I sometimes disagree on the math behind these concepts. We can talk about, <laughs> yeah, yes. we can talk about that later. Um, mm -hmm. But the massive asymmetry between the ability of a hacker to get into an organization and the ability of an organization to protect itself, um, you know, is, is, is almost immeasurable. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, one of the ways you, you mitigate that asymmetry is to deal with things like information classification and control. Mm -hmm. That's that's why we're here exactly for that. And uh, I recall in, in this kind of a discussion, uh, there was a story I tweeted a few weeks ago, and then you and I talked about it at our last lunch. Uh, this idea that the failure to do these some of these kinds of things like we're talking about is a hidden debt on the balance sheet of an organization. I remember that discussion we had. Uh, and it, it strikes me that way. I mean, you said it so eloquently the other day. It is. It, it's, it's, it's what can be called cyber, in a very broad sense, cybersecurity debt. Yeah. Um, 
you know, whenever people, and you've seen this and I've seen this, whenever, whenever folks are working with information technology, a lot of things happen. Um, the software that's being developed internally, uh, there are bugs, but the software has to be deployed so that it can begin, you know, getting monetized, right? That, the, a debt is created there. Um, if an internal upgrade and patching program is slowed down because it's too costly or they're short, you know, one person in their IT group. There's another off balance sheet debt that is being approved. So all these debts, all these obligations accrue. And the one thing we have learned is that eventually the due bill on each one of these debts gets presented. So yeah. I call it, you can call it information security debt, you can call it software debt, you can call it cybersecurity debt. But, but I think in terms of overall enterprise governance, you want to talk about managing your financial statement. Um, once you begin to understand how to calculate information security risk, and once you start thinking about the kinds of um, uh, damages that 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 being exposed to those risks can create, if they really if they really get played out like Equifax, you're talking about potentially very very large numbers, and it's a concept that a lot of people don't have in mind when they're thinking about information management, control, and security. Uh, but which very much needs to be kept in mind. Um, look, we run into to resistance uh, all the time about with companies that, well, we want to be secure, but we don't want our workflow slowed down. Right. Well, we want to be secure, but we really don't want to spend that much money becoming secure. Or my favorite, uh, why would anybody be interested in us? Uh, at this point, 2018, that answer should be obvious <laughs> right now. You have a computer, even if nothing else, people are going to want to use your computer to mine Bitcoin. So right away, you know, even if you've got no, inf it, literally, if you have no information on it, they, they, they still want it. Um, well, it, it's, but yeah. I, I do want to, to, to get a little repetitive, but I think the, yeah. the issues are significant enough, I think, to bear some repetition. Mm -hmm. This whole issue that you and I were talking about the other day about how to calculate information security risk. I really do not think that most organizations do a good job. I think they use the wrong math. I think that they use the wrong models. You know, that typical risk matrix um, where the probability of occurring is high, medium, mm -hmm. or low. And, you know, right. the impact if it does occur is, I mean, that to me is, is not just mindlessly simple, but really not very useful. I think you ought to have another one of these uh, webinars, by the way, on measuring cybersecurity risk. This is good. We can uh, we, we can schedule that for next February. We're booked through through January, but that's certainly something to consider because you're right. I will tell you, knowledgeable knowledgeable people who are 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 are, are using more robust models mm -hmm. to calculate various <clears throat> risk factors. The weight of risk attached to um, incompetent information identification and classification is enormous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, enormous. it is. If you, if, you if you don't know where your information is, that's precisely the business model that hackers are looking for. Not just social engineering, but you don't know where your stuff is because if you don't know where it is, it can be disappeared on you and you mm -hmm. don't know you suffered that harm. That's right. That that's God so true, so very true. Uh, just real quickly before we leave this slide, we've talked about GDPR. It's surfaced on a few slides already. California, uh, 2020. We'll have our own California-like GDPR. Say a few words about that and how that fits into what we're talking about. Well, it's not just it's just it's not just the the California Consumer Privacy Act, which <laughs> which does you know reflect aspects of the GDPR. In other words, uh, what that act does at a high level is it says that very much like in the European Union, that people individuals own their data. Persons own their data, and and so um, people who give their data to organizations have a suite of rights. Right? They have a right to know what kind of organization, uh, what kind of data the organization has on you. Uh, they can get the data erased. They can get the data corrected. They can get the data transferred in a non-HIPAA environment someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, all those rights that are enshrined in the GDPR. Uh, will find uh, will find their way in 2020 uh, into uh, into the actually it's not 2020 it's 2018 2019 2019 you're right 2019 yeah 2019 um, but you know California is not the only law you know you may know that um, 
uh, uh, Hank Johnson, the U.S. representative from Georgia, has reintroduced the uh, U.S. Data Security the Data Act of 2018, uh, and among other things, that act, if it goes into law, does have GDPR-like qualities, like like mm -hmm. permitting people to get their data, get companies to erase their data. So, you know, I, I think in that respect, Equifax really was kind of a tipping point. Not mm -hmm. so much that not so much that there was anything unique about it, because you know you heard me say you know, even before Equifax, that, that events of that magnitude were predictable. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the only thing significant about Equifax was its size, not the fact that it happened. Exactly. That, and there'll be more very much like it and, and possibly even worse. Um, and so what's happening is the, the inherently sectoral nature of U.S. information security law and privacy law is going to change because people are going to insist that it gets changed. California, you know, always a trailblazer in this area. Um, the Consumer Privacy Act, the 2018 Act, is not a model of clarity. You know, there'll be a number of amendments to fix some problems with it. Um, but that's not the wave of the future. I think the future is here. Mm -hmm. We're just going to see more and more and more of this. And I think that, that finally we're going to wind up seeing some of this at, a federal, at the federal level. Yeah. Uh, because it really is a national issue. Oh God, totally a national issue. Yes, yeah. Uh, okay, let's let's move on to the other side of this. Okay, the people responsible for securing the information they own. Um, and here again, it's uh, you know we we've written and this reflects the policy statement that we just had a few slides ago, where the uh, think information owner is a department manager. It's not always that case, but um, right. just in, in more general, they've got to identify the you know how sensitive the information is. They've got to approve personnel or job profiles permitted access to it. Uh, they've got to provide users with guidance. You know, Joe, you've got access to this. You can't share it with anybody. You know, that uh, kind of thing. No, and I, I, they've I got can, to maintain the inventory. Go well, ahead. I, if I can interrupt you for a moment, I, please. You, That's why you're here. Yeah. Have you. You, you, I think almost impl implicitly are suggesting that the kind of person you're describing on these slides going forward is actually locatable in an organization and who will do this job. Now, my own empirical experience mm -hmm. is that these kinds of people not only are difficult to find in terms of, okay, this is your new job, or will you do this job? Are you willing to do this job? But actually doing it the right way. Um, mm -hmm in the context of most governance structures that I encounter, mm -hmm. uh, in the context of uh, the level of resources, you know, allocated to this role. So I, I think what you say here sounds very good. I think it's very crucial. But my experience is finding these people and making sure they do the job the way the job is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I find that, that's, that to me is an enormous challenge for most organizations. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you there. And in, in, in some sense, Michael, this entire webinar series is geared around, in part, helping an organization figure out how to manage their information security uh, program so that, you know, there's that information security manager at the top supported by a leadership team. I think that was webinar three, if you right. will. Uh, though That's where the program starts. Well, it starts actually at the executive. There's a top-down flow. Ultimately, it gets to, I mean, let's take the example of an accounting department, for example, uh, where the information owner is typically a CFO, uh, and the CFO doesn't normally navigate in the space of the things we've got listed on this slide. So part of what needs to be done is to help the information owner understand that this is now this is now part of the new job description that the person has, the CFO has, or the head of HR has, or or whoever. Um, and even beyond that, and we'll get into this in the next slide when we start looking at well, how do we actually do? How do we conduct an information inventory? You start asking people, you ask the people in the accounting department, well, okay, here's a piece of information you work with. Who decides how sensitive it is? And they typically don't know. There's not been that ongoing embedding of information security management into the cultural aspects of the organization so that 
you know, everybody knows, I mean, the first things you learn are where the water fountain and the restrooms are when you go to work for a new company. Very soon after that, you begin to learn the, the things that you need to get your job done. We need to integrate into that the things you need to do to protect the information that you have access to to get your job done. This is all part of a, of a systemic exercise in moving past what you've talked about seeing regularly, where this well, information just is not captured. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But, but, but look, when I, I, I got to the point where we, we realized that to, 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 to achieve some, some form of GDPR compliance with the companies we were, we were counseling, we needed to get faster buy-in from all stakeholders, right? Because everybody saw this as kind of an ominous, menacing thing that was going to cost a fortune, was going to require them to learn things they had never known before, and might cause a great deal of brain damage, you know, in the process of, of education. Right. And so my team, um, you know, began to conclude and ultimately did conclude that, that in our preliminary meetings with stakeholders, we had to get very, very simple. And I think one of the, one of the mistakes that, that, that a number of programs I've seen, a number of efforts that I've seen and even been involved in, and certainly training that I want to talk about in a, in a minute, um, and I want you to express your views about it as well, because, you know, like teaching people how to do this, you know, embedding the sensitivity into a culture of an organization, really what it comes down to is, do you collect personal information? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. That's an easy question. What kind of personal information do you collect? Where do you put it after you collect it? Mm -hmm. Who has access to it? How long do you keep it? Those questions can be simplified. They are simple questions. They can be deployed very simply. When you start simplifying this stuff, you can make what really is a very complex engagement a lot simpler because what you're getting with those simple questions, those simple concepts are things that the line people who you absolutely need to get this done, get them to understand these concepts fairly quickly. They don't need to know what a border gate protocol is, Stan. Mm -hmm. They don't need to know that stuff, right? I don't even to... tell you what a border gate protocol is anymore either. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but what they can understand is, okay, yeah. here's a bucket, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. This information yeah. goes into this bucket. This information goes into that bucket. And I think one of the uh, shortcomings of a lot of training is that it's non-contextual. I mean, mm -hmm. some of it's very good. You know, you got the stick figures. You got the cartoons. I happen to like those, by the way. Um, but I've come to conclude that in order to get this done, you can't you can't constantly be, you know, in the gray latitudes, right? So if we're talking about Citadel Information Group, let's have a training program that is in the context of Citadel Information Group, mm -hmm. not some other information group, mm -hmm. but your group in your premises, given the kinds of clients you have, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, people in your organization, I don't probably think all of your people do not need to know about the Department of Defense DFAR regulation. Correct. It's just not necessary, right? And I think what a lot of training programs do, um, many of them well-intentioned, is that they're simply not in context. And if it's not in context, it's not going to stick with people. And if it doesn't stick with people, the shortcuts begin to get taken. As you know, you've seen the statistics. They begin to get taken almost immediately. Yeah, yeah. No, I, you're, you're so right on. Uh, I mean, it's part of our belief that the best training is face to face you're in a context of business context an, an organizational context because in our case uh several of our clients are nonprofits not businesses but it's like we it's about the organization it's about the specific organization information the organization has and right. it's it's story based what are your experience here's what we see what do you see joe how do people protect passwords in the organization? Sally, is that consistent with how your people protect information? Let's get right. that dialogue going. Let's start, ultimately, let's start talking with each other because that, that's the beginning place of culture. Uh, my view, and you know, I've seen this so often, um, is if you're looking at, if, if, if the requirement is to take a course 
online so that you can check a box that you've taken a course, that may be fine for compliance purposes. Yes, all of our people have sexual harassment training. Yes, all of our people have uh, information security training, but does it make a difference? That's not asked when you're checking a box for compliance. If right whether from the legal perspective or more gener more generically from the management perspective, we really want to make a difference, then it's not enough to simply check a box that somebody, yes, I, I, I was busy uh, reading the news and listening to music on my two of my monitors on my screen. Well, the third monitor, I kept pushing the button down. Yes, I've seen this page of the awareness program. Yes, I've seen this page of the awareness program and nothing sticks. Right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. so let me so let me ask you a question here on this slide. I, <laughs> I, I I know you've encountered this because we've talked about it. What what do you do when you go into an organization and there there is nobody yet in charge mm -hmm. of information? Let's mm -hmm. the information yeah. manager, whatever, see right. whatever title yeah. you want. Right. And and the, ultimately, the answer is the same as the answer to the question, how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite well, at a time. You, you get started. Uh, well, yeah, well, I understand that, but that's easy to say, though. But how do you, because I know you've actually achieved this, too, when yeah. you've gone into an organization yeah. and actually yeah. wound up having somebody in charge. How do you right. make that happen? So, first of all, those pieces of it, and we've covered those in other webinars as well, but you've, the, the executives have got to appoint a security manager, somebody that has overall responsibility, authority, et cetera. That person's got to begin the process of look at the last several webinars. Ultimately, you get to this level where now you're ready, you've got policies and standards in place, you've trained people, you've done a risk assessment, you know where your biggest holes are, um, and you're beginning to manage those in an ongoing way and at that point you get the time available if you will the resources available okay it's time to take a deeper dive now it's time to step back from those top level questions that you have and let's now really get down and dirty with the information. And for us, we we start collecting an information inventory. It's a three-phase process. The first phase leaves you with nothing but getting started, if you will. I mean, it truly is. You interview managers. You focus on, the, like you said, you focus on the information, not on the system. What's the information you use? You know, uh, one of the things you look at there, and you, you alluded to it earlier, all the shadow systems are out there. The spreadsheets that, you know, they're, they're not formally, yeah, we've got this big HR database and all of our people's electronic protected health information is on it. But what about the spreadsheet that Sally's got in her office where uh, it's a username and a piece of critical identifying information that helps Sally manage this? Oh. We got to capture that information as well. Who owns it to our discussion? Oftentimes you get the answer, we don't know who owns it. How sensitive is it? Well, gee, I think it's sensitive, but nobody's ever told me. That's the sort of stuff that you get. We simply, I mean, to us, it's let's just prepare a spreadsheet. Uh, last one we did had that, I'll go that in the next slide, had about 1,400 rows on it. Of we, we interviewed 15 people, I think, in the organization. Just talk to us, collect, and we just, it's collect it. It's collect the information, put it in a, a spreadsheet, and that's the starting point for all of this. And I want to jump to the next slide because it kind of shows you at a high level some of the stuff that, that surfaced. This is a real a real world example. Uh, the company is about a $40 million services organization. Uh, they've got information on site and desktops and servers. They've got a lot of stuff in the cloud in box. They've got other cl cloud platforms. They use 365, you know, for email and things. They don't use SharePoint. That's box uses is, is that for them. Um, and what you see here is, you know, look at all the information categories that don't have that contain restricted information that don't have any identified owners. So that's okay, fine. That's 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 the starting point. Now let's go out and okay, Sally, you said there's you're collecting this kind of information and you don't know the owner. Okay, security manager. We need to sit down with Sally's boss and sort out, okay, who owns this? So we begin to get the ability to work our way around this. Uh you know, you you get some of this stuff is knowingly managed 
others is managed, but nobody really knows how. And so you begin to see those kinds of things. This opening, uh, it's very incomplete because people don't know the answers to these questions. That's okay. There's inconsistencies. You know, Sally says, well, this information is not sensitive. And Bob says, this information sensitive. Clearly, we got to go to somebody that Bob and Sally report to who's responsible for that information and say, okay, we need to specify. Let's be correct. You know, um, and other things are going to be Sally's going to say or Bob's going to say something that in retrospect is going to just turn out to be wrong because we're just beginning this process now. I mean, this is for us the opening phase of this. And you don't do this day one. This you do six months, three months, maybe nine months into the program. You've got enough yeah, yeah. I, low I, level, I, low hanging fruit done that no, you can I, I, get no, to I, something I, this way. I, I think in our, our GDPR work, you know, we, we have to do a lot of triaging. But, you know, in the normal yeah. case, when an organization has more time and a different kind of commitment to information mm -hmm. security, you're getting in and conditioning that organization for quite a long period of time mm -hmm. before you actually start the project because. You know, as I was looking at the numbers here, I was I was kind of laughing to myself about um, how we the discussions we have with GDPR clients about uh, privacy by design and privacy by default and security by design and security by default mm -hmm. and how to incorporate in the how to how to incorporate that into the training programs mm -hmm. because people were our experience was people were very challenged with those concepts and um, not everybody believes the same thing you know, about a characteristic of a piece of information. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. and, and that can be, that can be a very significant absorber of time, you mm -hmm. know, those kinds of debates. But I think what all of this leads to is, is a, an information leader who is both aware and empowered. Mm -hmm. Because if he or she doesn't have both those qualities, the project's not going to be a success. Exactly. That's so, so, so true uh, that the security manager has got to provide that leadership and that that knowledge base as, as well. I mean, a lot of our work with our clients is we provide those. I mean, the, the, our clients, like your clients, are busy running businesses or nonprofit organizations. They don't want to be bogged down with security, but they need it. The world has moved to a place where you can't survive uh, in in an organ an organization well, can't survive without this. So it's, uh, it's, I, I, it's I, I, just I, let me just finish a, a thought. Uh, and and the, some of the challenge is this evolution of security privacy by default to mm -hmm. security privacy by design, right. and it's right. making that transition that becomes what's critical. Well, you know, it's it's look. I mean, I don't want an aircraft carrier in my backyard either. All right, but, <laughs> but, but I, I understand the need. I don't know right. if your backyard is big enough for one. Mine is not. Yeah. And, and so, I think that um, I think that in a lot of cases, probably most cases, I think that that preparatory, that conditioning process, yeah. has very much been shortchanged. I mean, yes. you, know, yeah. you can make any number of uh, uh, comparisons, find any number of analogies. You know, you don't go to training camp out of shape, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you go, you go in shape. That's not where you go to lose weight. Mm -hmm. You know. To, to play the season you don't do that yeah. um you know you don't wait until you get to washington dc to start practicing your supreme court argument right you know, yeah. you, yes you, like anything yeah. else you condition yourself you get yourself into a mental and organizational framework structure so you can make this happen but what's really critical also and and you know this in fact you were one of my early mentors uh, in this area which is you have to define your mission not organizations will not all have the same information security mission. I mean, it's easy to say we will be a data secure organization. Sure, everybody wants to be that, but the fact of the matter is that once or, once an organization begins understanding its operational and security risks, they can start making intelligent decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, we, we're okay being exposed to this risk. So you understand that if this risk materializes, here are the harms that can ensue. And, and look, not everything is existential. Mm -hmm. You know, you might lose a server or two. You might lose some machines. You might have to clean and re-image some machines. But not everything is an end-of-day scenario. Some things are end-of-day scenario. Um, but that, looking at this, for instance, um, 
Yeah, this is, well, I, I know you are managing it. I mean, this is manageable as long as you can translate these numbers into words. Mm -hmm. The pictures. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, exactly true. I wanted to move on to the the, the next slide because it's the again that the the first phase is okay. Let's get started. That's you know if you go to the the Nike ads and things like that, that's always the hardest thing. Let's get started. Just get going. Just get started. Bernard Malamud said the hardest the author the hardest thing is to get the pencil moving. You know, phase one that's hard. Once you get phase one done, now it's almost like just taking the time to follow up and follow through as a friend of mine described these kinds of of things uh you finish phase two is you, you finish it you sit down with uh, the security manager of the team you figure out who the owners are you ask the owners okay now that we know what's going on now begin to fill in the information the, resolve the inconsistencies uh complete the inventory section establish configuration control on the inventory itself so that you know, so the inventory is somewhat up to date with reality. It's never going to totally match because inventories. You walk into a, a, a supermarket, what they show on their inventory and what they actually have on the shelves may or may not be exactly the same, but they're going to be close. You're going to be in the ballpark. And then once you're there, you maintain this. But again, the hardest step uh, is is always that getting started piece. Well, yeah, and, and you have this phase two complete. You know, a, a comment about that. So I, my experience has been that <clears throat> you got to be very careful about your word choices mm -hmm. in this environment because when you tell somebody, because a lot of these projects are very challenging for people. Uh, it, it, it's an overlay to the work they already have to do. They understand mm -hmm. that... Uh, a failure to do a good job could have some very serious circumstances. I think more people are getting appropriately more aware about mm -hmm. that. Uh, you're not completely, but but better than it used to be. You tell people something is completed, you're to me, you're done. Yeah. And I mean done, yeah. done. Yeah. Like you ain't getting to phase three. Mm -hmm. That's the rule again. That it, yes, and because I agree with you. I mean, human nature being what human nature is, you're absolutely right. And yet, the part of part of the responsibility of leadership and below leadership, uh, below below the executive leadership, the the leadership of the security manager and this team is to help the organization know that when we're we're never complete, we complete a particular piece of the puzzle. And now it goes into maintenance mode. We still have to maintain it. We're going to be getting more information in. New categories of information are going to emerge. New laws on information. We've already talked about the California Consumer Protection Law coming into effect, et cetera. So that at some level, Michael, and you and I both know this, we've talked about that. Uh, information security management is not a one and done. You're never finished with it. It's the new normal. You have got to manage it. Somebody's got, there's got to be a security manager, uh, depending on which language you use in what organ, you know, what frameworks you use. There's got to be an information security management program. And it's in the context of that, that these things happen. Read my treatise when it's published. that will answer all of those questions for you. <laughs> it, might, it, might, it might even ask some quotes from you. But let's, let's get back yeah. to this. To stand this complete because um, maintain is one thing. Everybody has challenges maintaining these programs. Yeah. You know, people come, people go, people realize that changes have to be made, more data is being accumulated. But this whole idea of completion, one of the things that 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 we began thinking about a lot, and one of the things that, that concerns us, still concerns us quite a bit, is that people have a need to know when something is done. The concept of completed and finished and done in this environment is very different than like finishing a test or mm -hmm. a training pod, right? And, and it, 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 telling an organization that this project has been completed can have some very unfortunate consequences. Uh, so we use a variety of, of different rough equivalents but the word choices here, uh, how you classify this stuff and how you communicate it to people can have really significant implications on how effective this thing's going to be long term. So I personally, I mean, I know that complete is it's NIST, that's 27. I, I, I get all these structures use this. I just don't think it's an appropriate 
concept. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good I, I point. Charge you, I charge you, by the way. Yeah, yeah. No, and and, and I I accept that. And this this is I, I'm going to loop all the way back to you know this whole webinar series again. Um, secure the village. The idea that okay. We've got a ton of expertise in managing this stuff. You've got a ton of expertise on the legal side of guiding companies successfully through all of this. There's other people as well in this community, each with their own pieces. We all see, use the elephant metaphor earlier, and another elephant metaphor that I like is the idea of the blind men trying to describe an elephant. We're all, to me, we're all blind people describing the elephant. We all see different pieces of it. And it's as we put these pieces collectively together, we begin to get an understanding of the whole and what the challenges and implications are there. Uh, so I, I accept what you said. Uh, next time I do this webinar, uh, these words will be different, among other things. Because uh, you know, I, I, I respect what you're saying. We have to be very careful in our language around complete. Uh, and things like that. So I, I accept that. Yeah. yeah, and I think yeah. I think you know, for me, as a is a is a finishing thought, like a takeaway. Mm -hmm. This process doesn't have to be terribly complicated. Mm -hmm. it really doesn't. I mean, yeah, there are some complications, but the process itself does not necessarily have to be complicated. It, it does require planning. It does require some diligence. It does require someone to be in charge. But but riffing back to to you know what I said a few minutes ago, it's what kind of information do you collect? Who do you yeah. collect from? Yes. What do you, you, you don't need long questionnaires in the first instance. And doing yeah. it the way I think <clears throat> starts to condition, you know, the folks in charge with the broad categories of inquiries and mandates that are going to very much inform and drive the process of, of, yeah. of information classification, identification, classification, and control. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good segue to a wrap up for, for this talk, for this webinar. Uh, what we've done, we've identified the core security functions of what, where, who, those kinds of things. We've talked a bit about policy, how we classify information owners and owner invent the information inventory and so on. Uh, trying to help you, the listener, in this case, the viewer, in, in this case, wrap your head around this and understand that, you know, this is not something that is yet reduced fully to practice. This is still an ongoing, evolving uh, process for, for organizations. Do you have any final thoughts? Um, no, I think, well, uh, other, other than to say that I think this series of webinars is, is, is extremely useful. Uh, I, I think it's much needed. I think that it hits the, all the notes that have to be hit. And I, I, I want to compliment you and your organization. Um, on focusing on smaller and middle market companies who are very underserved in this information management security space. Yeah, well, first, thank you. And and uh, so much of it is, is a reflection and, and our village happens to be Los Angeles and we are a uh, small and medium sized business. Uh, that, that's the the ecosystem we find ourselves in. Uh, we don't. We've got some obviously some big companies, some of the studios, uh, etc., uh, are, are here. But so much of the economy of Los Angeles, of this region, not just LA itself, but the, the whole region, is driven by these small and medium-sized companies. That you know, they may have five, ten, fifteen, twenty people. They may have a couple of thousand people, but they don't, as a general rule, have the resources to have on staff, let's say, full-time security people or full-time legal counsel. And so they need this kind of guidance. And I, I, I want to compliment you back as well. I mean, I both on the work you do in the community, because we've known each other, good God's going on 20 years at this point, and we've seen each other's work, uh, but also the thought leadership that you bring to, to all of this. I mean, you're one of the, the key people that I look to when I start thinking about the le not just the legal aspects of cybersecurity, but how do you translate that le those legal the components into real world practices. And I think you're you're one of the thought leaders there. So I want to thank you as as well for for this. Uh, in wrapping up, we're at, at 10.59. Uh, let me quickly go through what's coming up next and all. Uh, September 6th is our next uh, webinar, Securing the Human. Uh, Michael's partner, uh, 
Robert Braun is going to be one of my guests on that. Um, we're going to look at it both from a legal side and also from the training awareness culture side as, as well. Um, our whole webinar series, there's always the first Thursday of the month, 10 a.m. Pacific. They're designed as much as we can to be practical, real world, how to, and actionable. You should be able to take what we've done here, provided you've also listened to the other six that we've already done, you should be able to really wrap your head around how do you do information classification and control. Here's the full schedule, September 6, securing the human. Uh, information on who we are, what we do. This is also on our website. Please visit us at securethevillage.org. For more information, I'll leave this on here for a moment or two so that people can write down, Michael, your phone number and your email address. If you are interested in sponsoring us, please let us know. Uh, you can email us directly at at, uh, uh, at info at securethevillage.org. Visit us at uh, uh, our website. There's a sponsorship opportunities page. We would love your sponsorship. Uh, we'd be very grateful for that, in, in fact. Um, and um, with that, it's the top of the hour. So uh, thank you again, Michael. And uh, we are adjourned. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.